Well, good evening, everyone. We're gonna let people filter on in and then we'll get started in about a minute or so. Thank you for joining us. It was sunny, but it's starting to look a little cloudy right now. I think they're calling for some showers. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was supposed to rain earlier today, but it hasn't. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're welcoming everyone and I think we'll go ahead and get started. You know, we, we go through the, the to do's in the beginning so that allows a little bit more time for people to get settled. Um, so my name is Celeste Feta. I am Director of Edu Education at VMFA and welcome to A Taste of Art, Wines of Portugal presented by Chase as part of our Fridays After Five series of programming. Tonight I'm joined by Harry Tation of Free Run Wine Mer Merchants and as always by Liz Skirpin, a muse manager. So good to see you all. Thanks for being here. Um, and thanks to everyone who is joining us this evening. So if you've been to Taste of Art before um, or even haven't been, it's always good to, to get a refresher of how this works. Um, so if you are pairing wine with us tonight, it's advised that you go ahead and open your bottles as we get started so we can transition smoothly between, between the wines. As a reminder, we're in a Zoom webinar format, which means that you can see us, but we cannot see you. I always say use that to your advantage as you like. Um, we'll be asking for your impressions of the wine if you're tasting with us and of the art. And we encourage you to use the chat feature this evening um, as opposed to the Q&A. That allows us to just focus on one box so we can get to your uh, questions as quickly as possible. And we always try to answer those live. Um, if we can't get to you live, we'll try to answer it in the chat and all of us will be monitoring that box. So while someone else is chatting or talking, we might prompt each other to answer a question. Um, I also will say that, you know, we approach these as very a casual conversation. Um, so just kind of sit back, enjoy, and ch again, chime in into the chat if you'd like to participate or share some of your thoughts and impressions. Um, so with that being said, we're going to roll right into um, our talk this evening, and I'm going to turn over the floor to Harry, who's going to kick us off with orienting us on where are these wines are from tonight and uh, what we'll be talking about. So Harry. Perfect, thanks. Hello everyone. Um, well, Celeste and Liz, thank you again for having me. I've done a few of these tastings now and they've, I think they're so much fun. It's, it's, uh, it's good educational, um, it's fun. People are so in their houses now. I think people are excited to be able to have a way to do things to kind of reach out. So thank you everybody for joining. Um, so we have two wines tonight from Portugal. The first one we're gonna have is from a producer called Quinta de Raza. And they are in the Vino Verde region, which is up in the Northwest part of Portugal, right on the Atlantic Ocean there. Um, Celeste has a really good map up there. And the blow up is of the Vino Verde region. And on the far right hand side, you see uh, the town that, uh, that these guys are in. Um, excuse me, I just lost a little thing on my screen. There we go. Sorry. Um, so they're in that far eastern town of Basto. There's actually a mountain range between them and the Atlantic coast. So they're in a very unique area compared to the rest of the Vino Verde region, which gets more of a maritime influence. You guys are on the east side of the mountain, so they don't have the maritime influence. Um, so Vino Verde is the name of the region. Um, it is in uh, northwest Portugal, like this. The grapes that, uh, that are used in that region, at least for Quinta de Raza, uh, they use, uh, uh, sorry, Arento. 50% of a grape called Arinto, 35% of a grape called Azal, and 15% of a grape called Trajadura. And these are all indigenous grapes to Portugal. Um, back up a little bit about the winery. Quinta de Raza as a winery itself is exciting for me to sell. They've been around since 1769. They are family owned, they're estate bottled. Uh, what that means is they control everything that happens in the vineyards, how the grapes are tended, how the vines are fertilized or not fertilized or, or thinned. 
Um, when you own your land like that, you have complete control. And I think that's the truest way for winemakers to make wine. Uh, so the winery got started in 1769 by the Coejo family. Uh, Jose Coejo is the fifth generation now. He's probably about 44 years old and he's now running the winery. Um, they, uh, Vino Verdes as a type of wine have become really popular. They're a little bit lower alcohol than most white wines. They tend to be, at least the Raza is about 11 and percent. Uh, I always think it was being just a perfect summertime patio type white. It's light, it's refreshing, it's got a little bit of a spritz. Um, I think when people think the spritz, they think it might be like champagne, but it actually is what they would call like a frizzante. It's lightly spritzed. It's not quite as sparkling as, a, as, as, um, as champagnes. Food-wise, I think it's perfect with shellfish or oysters. Um, it's perfect with salads. It's got a really great acidity, kind of a liminess note to it. I know some people have the bottles and hopefully people are uh, having a chance to taste this, but I think it has kind of a greenish color. Um, you know, Vino Verde kind of translates into green wine. And I think lots of people think that's the, the name of the grapes and everything, but it's actually the name of the region, just like Chablis in Burgundy is the name of a region. So Vino Verde is the name of this region, but kind of a lime greeny uh, note to it. Um, you definitely have, I think, kind of a great acidity, a minerality in it. And maybe because they're more inland uh, on the other side of the mountains, they get more of a mineral note than a salinity soap, which, uh, note, which you might get closer to the, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. So go ahead and give it a taste, see what you think. Um, hopefully some of you might have had this before. This is a pretty popular wine for, uh, for our company in Richmond. We do really well with this. Uh, for it to be a, a state bottle producer from 1769, and um, I know it's pretty reasonably priced wine. I think there's a lot of Vina Verdes in the market, but I believe that this is one of the only ones that's a state bottled. A lot of the Vino Verdes come from what they call bulk juice and negotiant juice. And nothing wrong with that, but I think if these guys can do it with their own land and put in that same kind of price, that's a, a pretty good accomplishment. So everybody give it a taste, see what you think. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy it. I always say wine is the most subjective beverage. One person's favorite wine is another person's least favorite wine. And the thing to remember about that is you're exactly right either way, so. Tastes like summertime. Tastes like perfect sitting on a beach and drinking it and eating fish tacos. It fish is, tacos would be perfect, yes. <laughs> yeah, it is delicious. It's, I, I like, it's so citrusy. Like it makes my, like pucker, like I would like the pucker. Your mouth, water. Make your mouth water a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it is citrus. But I think that's what makes some good food wines too. They're great for like, like I said, patio sipping, but with a meal, this is a great compliment, I think. Oh yeah. And then Harry, I've got that, this image of Pedro yeah. Campo up. So if you could tell us a little bit about his role at the winery sure. and the one on the picture on the left may look familiar to uh, some of our uh, visitors who come to the museum. So um, Pedro Campo was in Richmond, I guess it was, uh, it was probably in 2019. He was here, it was in the fall of 2019 and we did a tasting at the museum. And uh, it was such a great tasting. Um, one of the things I thought was really uh, fun about it is that he is, uh, He's a farmer. Uh, he doesn't travel much. Uh, the owners usually travel for the winery, but uh, he came on this trip and he was such a humble fella, a farmer, and he wasn't used to the crowds and everything. And when we did our tasting at the museum, he had a line for two hours, which I thought was just fantastic. He was blown away by the, uh, the response he got in Richmond. Uh, but when he's making wines like this that are affordable and really drinkable, and I mean, he's, like I said, he's a very humble, gentle man. Um, uh, I'm glad he's doing what he's doing. Very nice fellow. Um, and just to come back to kind of um, some food pairings, Joanne is, has observed that it's very nice with our cheese, salami, and prosciutto. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an image of the winery, the, the vineyards at the winery. Um, and then these two images on the left, um, Harry, you were sharing that these are Pedro's in this picture. I want yeah, to say, like on the right. In the Jeep there, uh, the one on the far left is um, uh, Jose Diogo, who is the owner, uh, Jose Diogo Coejo. This is, it's his winery. The fellow on the far right in the picture is, um, is Pedro, the winemaker. I'm not sure who the fellow in the middle is, but it's just them riding through the vineyard. On the right is one of their um, wooden presses, which is uh, very interesting. Um, I think it's we're trying the white ones. I think a lot of people think of Vino Verde, the region, and everybody thinks, of course, of this wine, which is white, light, and sparkly. But they do make some red wines also, as evidenced by the, the, the crush picture there. Um, but Vino Verde is king, that's for sure, the, the white for them. And then this image of the grape. 
And this is one of the, um, I'm not sure if it's the Azal, the Arento, or the Trajadura, honestly. This is what one of the white varietals they use in this blend. Again, a state bottled. You know, when I talk about them having complete control, see all the, the leaves around the grapes. Um, winemakers and vineyard managers during the year just constantly walk through the vineyards, especially when everything's at leaf, and they will just pull off leaves um, to thin the vineyards of, of leaves to get more exposure, get more sun exposure to the grapes. Uh, I think that's just, that's pretty much the epitome of hands-on winemaking and vineyard management. And you see that a lot. A lot of big wineries don't do that. They just grow, harvest, and, and make wine. But these guys are actually in the vineyard manually uh, making sure everything is right all the time. And I think that's a, that's, that's a great way to do it. It's the right way to do it. And Harry, coming back to kind of the fizz in this yes. wine, how does that happen? So there's a couple, I think um, traditionally, uh, a long time ago, the way it was made was fermentation was kind of stopped with a little bit of uh, um, sugars waiting to turn into yeast. And so you would end up with a little bit of bubbles left if you stop the fermentation. Um, I believe that most likely, uh, although these guys run from 1769, because it's at that price point, I'm assuming that this is uh, probably a CO2 added, which I believe is that's pretty much the common way that all vino verdes are made now. Um, the idea of doing it for that long, uh, the long fermentation and then stopping it with what left, um, uh, it would, that's be a different animal of wine, I think. Um, but I think that the, the way that they're doing this with the injection of CO2, I mean, it sounds like a weird, but that is a way that a lot of sparkling wines are made, uh, unless they're made in a champagne style, which does take a long time and, and um, it's a different process. Yeah. Great, thank you. But the light spritz, I think, just makes it exciting. It makes it fun. The acidity and the bubbles actually clean your mouth. I put down creamy cheeses as an idea of something to have because I think that when you have that acidity, that really helps kind of keep your mouth clean. Um, you know, lots of times people talk about wine and cheese as a, as a good, a good uh, pairing thing. Um, but interestingly, the lactic acids on cheese sometimes can mask the flavors of the wine. So I think that if you can have a wine that can has acidity like this to cut through those creamy at the creamy uh, nature of the cheeses, it gives you a better complement of the two of each other. So another observation here, um, Kathy said, "Not my favorite. Tastes like baking soda." Yeah, I mean, and that's I, I say it all the time. It's uh, I never like to say the flavors that people are going to taste because if I say this tastes like apple, somebody's going to say, "Well, I don't taste apple." So they think that they're wrong, but they're hmm. not really wrong because they perceived a different fruit flavor. And yeah. I think they're still right because of that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the baking soda, uh, you know, honestly, I think that, you know, wine is very subjective. And I think it's also affected by everything that we do. You know, if you drink a lot of coffee, if you smoke a lot of cigarettes, if you do a lot of different things, we all physiologically are going to perceive flavors a little differently. Um, not saying that's right or wrong, but I do believe that, yeah, you could come up with something like a baking soda type of note on this, a very clean type of note. I definitely agree with that. It's definitely a clean smell on this. Mm -hmm. And I know we've said this before, but kind of those observations are very similar to art. You know, you're not going to like every work of art you see or talk about, and you may see something completely different, you know, than, than somebody else. And that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> totally if, it's okay. Thing, if it's not your thing, then you're still right. That's, that's the, right. I always remember about this. That's right. Um, so let's talk about what um, what Amuse is pairing with this selection, Liz. So we did the kind of our, our OG, our, our uh, fried oysters, the curry fried oysters. We've had them in our menu, I believe, since the Maharaja exhibit. And they were so good that everyone asked us to bring them back. So we did immediately. And we haven't gotten rid of them the past seven years, I think. So <laughs> we keep them on the menu. They're delicious. Um, Greg, Chef Greg's background is in seafood and, and he's Greek. So you'll see a lot of that coming forward. But these uh, oysters are has have a slight curry in the batter. And then um, it has pickled onions and different type of pickles on top. And then a creamy raita on the bottom. And it was perfect with this wine. Mm. Outside, it was gorgeous on Wednesday, what, 80 degrees on the patio. Mm. A glass of this wine and fried oysters was delicious. Nice. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> And um, people can get this by the glass, is that? Absolutely. And, and use, okay. This and our great. oysters. And the oysters, nice. Absolutely. Nice, nice. Um, well, thinking about the art to pair um, along with this selection. So um, at the museum, we don't have a lot of Portuguese art, <laughs> artists represented. Um, so we did, um, 
uh, find a few things um, that has Portugal as a subject matter. Um, and then we're also going to spend a little bit of time talking about the labels of both of the, both of the selections tonight. So it's sort of a, a twofer uh, for, each, for each bottle. So the first work we're going to look at today as you're sipping your Vino Verde is this photograph by Eduard de Bubat. Um, by, and it's Femmes of Fleur, and uh, taken in 1958 and printed in 1981 as part of a portfolio of his work that came out in 1981. And we'll come back to the image in a minute, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Edouard. This is a picture from his uh, 1943 French passport. He was born in Paris and grew up in the Montmartre uh, neighborhood. Um, and he started taking photographs um, with a um, Rolofex camera um, in 1948 um, and um, also trained as a photo engraver before that. He was actually in two years during the war um, in forced labor um, over, uh, went into service of every French citizen apparently had to do that in, in Germany. Um, so after the war, he came back to Paris and again, took up photography. Um, and he was really um, interested in kind of observational photography uh, in black and white, of course. Um, he received the first Kodak prize ever given uh, for one of his photographs. Um, and in 1951, during an exhibition of his work at a local bookstore, um, he was approached by um, the artistic director of a magazine called Realité, so realities. So again, gets back to kind of this image and, and trying to um, capture what is happening around you. And so he worked for that magazine as a reporter and a photojournalist till 1967. So that time frame, 1951 to 1967, is when the photograph um, was taken and how he got to travel everywhere. So he traveled to Portugal, he traveled to Asia, he traveled to the States. I mean, kind of went all over um, for kind of assignments with the magazine taking photographs. Um, and I like this quote um, Jacques Privé wrote um, about him. In the most far, far away lands, Bubat seeks and finds oasis. He is a peace correspondent. Um, so instead of a war correspondent, he is there to take images that are peaceful or of kind of the scenery or of people and landscape. Um, so a great uh, examples from of that are from the same portfolio I mentioned. These are in the museum's collection. On the left is Leila Brittany, uh, taken in 1948, again, a year after he won that Kodak Prize. This is one of his most famous photographs. So if you, if you look up Bubat, this is going to come up over and over again. It's a stunning image of a woman from Brittany. And on the right, a little pixelated, my apologies, but this is of a flax field in Normandy, just to show his range of both landscape, but also portrait photography. Um, and coming back to this image, you get that kind of sense of, of environment and what's happening and kind of the local flair, these um, two women probably going to a flower market, bouncing these baskets on their head. Um, and he also said kind of of his, of his um, kind of uh, approach to photography, he has said, there is something instinctive about the moment you choose to take a photograph. It is not the result of thought or reflection. The strength of composition is always born of the instant of the decision. So it's kind of thinking about that in an artist's mind, kind of looking at the scene and, and deciding to take this photograph. The composition is just so balanced here. Um, I think just from the left and the right, uh, the way that they're kind of looking in the left-hand direction, and then the way the flowers just take over that top third of the photograph. Um, it's really a, a moment in time, but also very artistic in the way that it's presented and captured. So mm -hmm. like I, I mentioned, kind of it's part of this uh, portfolio of his work, again, um, that spans um, his career, so published in 1981, so picked to really represent his travels um, and his time kind of working both in France, but also all over the world. Um, so I'm just wondering too, if, if people, if anyone out there has been to Portugal, if, if you've seen any scenes like this, I have not been, and I don't know, I, I know none of us have been, so drop it in the chat, um, or really just impressions of this work, or if you're familiar with Bobat and seen the other images I referenced, um, definitely welcome um, some observations. You know, it's, uh, I, I know wine, of course, better than art, uh, but I do uh, like this, this photograph because it's, 
the symmetry of it, if it makes sense, you know, yeah. the, the largeness of those baskets on top with the two women in dark clothes directly below it, the line in the wall directly, you know, uh, waist high on them. Yeah. It's kind of, that caught my eye. Yeah. Well, it's definitely, you see that kind of in like that sections, you know, it's like the bottom half, yeah, bottom yeah. third, middle third, top third. And that's very, you know, you see that a lot in landscape painting. If you look at a landscape, it's often kind of cut into those thirds or actually film. So movies, there's this um, great list going around the internet, kind of like looking at famous uh, directors and how they frame scenes. Um, and that third, like the third and the third and the third happens quite often. So yeah, definitely see why you could pick up on that, Harry, for sure. Um, Denise has shared, have, has, she's been, but did not say anything like this, but I was on the coast mostly. I love this and I love the subject matter. It is intriguing to me. I want to know where they're going. I want to know where they got their flowers from. Yeah. I want to know what they do and where the house is like. Like there's so many levels to it that I enjoy to just keep exploring it. Yes, for sure. I mean, it tells a story. And I think that's something all of his portraits or, or photographs, I feel like do. Like if we come back to you know, Layla, kind of the same thing. Who is this woman? You know, who's the who's the person behind her? Like, what is she thinking? Um, and and the field, you know, what's taking place in that field? What's happened? You know, think about Normandy and and that association with World War II. So there's just just all these stories that under underpin um, his work. And there's just a very gentle quality, I feel like, too, um, to his photographs. Um, Natalia mentioned the baskets look like they're floating. Yes, our really? colleague Kristen <laughs> pointed that out uh, uh, earlier this week because you can barely see kind of the scarves that are the white scarves on their head. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I wonder if they're going to market for those baskets or if it's like a commission, they're making a delivery to a home yeah. or a business. I mean, so you, you never know, but yeah. it is, you think about it. Because they're pretty dramatic uh, arrangements. Yes, they are. <laughs> And very spring-like too. I feel like even though this is black and white, you can kind of like imagine what those, that basket of the color in those baskets, you know, must be like. Right. Um, so great compliment, I feel like to the wine. Um, so the next, uh, so I, I said we were gonna talk a little bit about labels. So um, pretty striking label with the, with the Raza. So it's like this outline of a bird. Um, so I'm just sharing, um, an image of the bird that it's um, borrowing from. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is a, um, a kestrel, a lesser kestrel, which is a, a part of the kind of the peregrine falcon um, family. So again, pretty close in the way that the artist has depicted it here in flight. And this is an image of it perching. And Harry, I think this is actually from the vineyard. This is at the vineyard of uh, Quinta de Raza, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we've, um, in previous Taste of Arts, we've talked about falconry a little bit and its association with vineyards. You can um, revisit that if you'd like um, on our YouTube page, um, the video that we, we talked about this. And we were all kind of speculating, you know, is the encouragement of, of falconry or, or falcons kind of a pest control, uh, natural pest control for the vineyards. That yeah, might be. I'm sure. I'm sure it's for cleaning out rats and rodents yeah. and uh, snakes. Maybe don't know. Um, <laughs> don't know how many of those are harmful to vineyards. Um, but uh, I guess a burrowing, a burrowing uh, critter could probably mess up the vines. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then thinking about again, kind of pulling in some objects from our collection. So this is a falcon amulet from our Egyptian collection that's on view in the galleries now. Very tiny. Um, but sitting the same way our, our, our uh, lesser kestrel friend was sitting on the vines. And the falcon amulet, falcon um, is usually associated with um, um, Horus, so the god Horus. Um, and on the left is from the temple of Edfu. So this is a huge depiction of the god Horus who has a falcon head. Um, and you see he's wearing the, the crowns of United Egypt, so upper and lower Egypt, um, and also known as the son of Osiris and Isis. Um, and there's a, a long story about kind of how he became their son and, he, and he, they, he got into a battle with Seth, who was Osiris's brother. Um, so, and, and eventually one over Set and, but unfortunately Set destroyed one of his eyes and they had to be kind of pieced back together, but now his eye or the eye of Horus or the wedget. And you see that on the right, um, on the coffin of our mummy Chebby, also on view. Um, 
is the eye of Horus, which is a protector, sort of like an evil eye um, and warding off evil spirits. So Horus is really seen as a, someone who protects. Um, and if you think about, you know, the falcon in that vineyard, they're sort of protecting the vineyard by getting away, you know, getting rid of the vermin who might be bringing harm, you know, so it's, it's definitely this over kind of connecting of, of symbolism and the purpose of the falcon, um, which is a great kind of shared language among very two very different cultures, right? We're kind of very far apart in terms of geography, but some commonality there um, that is great to share. And I love kind of the idea of exploring these labels a little bit, you know, although not specific to Portugal, it lets us expand a little bit and thinking a little bit more broadly about representation and works of art. We're getting a lot of great comments about Portugal and sharing some of people's experiences, which I'm loving. Um, so Birch shared when I was in Portugal, spent most of the time west of Lisbon and along the Atlantic, eating seafood and drinking white wines. Uh, stayed a week in the resort town of Cassius, Cassius, saying that right. And though along, we enjoyed Portugal very much, did get far north as Porto, but not as far as these, spent more time in the south, enjoyed the wines very much, good value. Um, and we'll be talking about a Southern wine next. Yes, yes, the next one is from the south. Yeah, so Harry, tell us where this one is from. Sure, so this one is from, um, if you have your cursor, so mm -hmm. let's run down to the bottom left. Um, Can we see that? Right there, Stubal, that orangey region, that's where this next winery is from. And that's on what they call the um, Stubal Peninsula, which is that area right there. And they are right next to, connected to, a uh, estuary uh, the, um, called the Sado Estuary. So the winery we're going to talk about is called Herdad de Gamba. There's your picture, there's pictures there. So, um, so these guys in, um, are in Stubal. Um, they are a, a state bottle. They use all of their own fruit also. Um, and all of their labels, from a, a stack standpoint, a lot of their labels have different uh, birds on that. And I know that uh, Celeste will talk a little bit more about the birds in a couple minutes. Um, but uh, these guys, um, so they're in Stubal, which is just directly south of Lisbon, on that far Atlantic west coast of Portugal. Um, their winemaker is a fellow named Nuno Cancella de Abreu. He's fourth generation winemaker. Uh, his family's been making wine for over 130 years. Um, he has been awarded winemaker of the year twice in Portugal, which is kind of cool. Uh, this wine that we're doing, the Herda de Gambia Tinto, is a three grape uh, blend also, just like the Raza Vino Verde was also. The grapes on this one are Torrega Nacional, Syrah, and Aragonias. Torrega Nacional is actually the main red grape that you'll see in ports. Um, and actually, uh, so port, uh, you've had before, I'm sure, that fortified, darker wine, you can have more of an after-dinner type of thing, but Torrega Nacional is, is one of the main grapes of that. They also blend in Syrah, and obviously Syrah is not an, an indigenous grape to this area. Um, that's probably why they have to call it a red blend instead of a uh, Stubel, I guess, uh, wine or something from that. Um, and then Aragonias. Aragonias is a very traditional grape you see in Spain and Portugal. Um, fermentation on this was done all in stainless steel. Um, there's no oak. We should go ahead and pour uh, some if people have not yet. I have not yet. All right, did I get ahead? <laughs> and um, Harry, I, I, I flipped forward to the great picture, but I can kind yep. of go back if you want to talk about this um, image. I think or the landscape, I mean, I think building. at least the landscape, you're definitely, like I said, they're close to, uh, they're, they're close to the ocean. Um, I have not been to Portugal, um, so I, I can't say firsthand exactly how far this is from the from the uh, from the ocean. But at least looking at the maps, there, um, it's not far. And I do think that the maritime influence does affect um, wines in this region, especially. Um, and what that does is, like, you have a really big diurnal swing of temperatures. You can have like really cold nights and really warm, breezy days. Uh, and I think that you know grapes are kind of a weed. They, they like to stress. They like things to make them work harder, make their roots grow a little bit further deep for more, more nutrients and things. So I think that's kind of a, uh, an interesting thing about um, of wines, especially that have that air from the ocean, which I think dries out a lot. So, so three grapes, um, fermented all in stainless steel, and then goes into oak barrels for three months. So yeah, give it a taste and see if uh, what you like. Portuguese wines have been, you know, kind of, simmering for being really popular, I think, for years. Um, Vino Verde, of course, became such a huge thing for them, but there's so many great wines made in Portugal from other grapes that I think, and this is a great example of it. Um, when most people think of Portugal, I think they think of 
uh, Vino Verde or kind of some very inexpensive uh, red wines. Uh, but I think this being a state bottled, uh, you know, hand, uh, handmade uh, wine, um, it comes across. I think it's a very well-made, you get a nice lingering finish on, on these wines. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be great for any kind of grilled meats. You know, reading from the winery, they were talking about grilled red and white meats. So yeah. I guess you could do this with a chicken. I guess with the, that flavor of the char and the grill would probably work a little bit with this. I mean, not that you should burn your chicken. Um, we did lamb because I thought the lamb was a really nice call with it. Um, I would lean to a red meat uh, before I would uh, white meat, but. Yeah, I, we originally thought about a thin slice of grilled meat, like beef would be really good, but then yeah. the several people in our little tasting uh, recommended lamb and we tried it with the lamb and it was fabulous and I said, I said Greg is Greek so he did a Greek style lamb um, in the Easter spirit I guess still so it's shaved like a lamb and it's cooked with Greek green beans and potato wedges with some feta and a really nice jus from the lamb it's delicious it went very well with this red which I was also very pleasantly surprised about um, it starts off so a little fruity but then it hits with some spice and some tannin and it does linger for a long time. I think it's fabulous. So um, yes, next, Denise, it is on our menu right now. Um, the, next, the next time that we do this, can um, can we meet and maybe have the chef fix some of these dishes? Yeah, totally. You want to come eat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you would. That, that looks fantastic. That lamb. Yeah, is fantastic. it is. I mean, it looks springy. It looks fresh. I mean, although it's a red meat, it looks fresh and springy. And I think it's just a... a it is. Perfect. And I, I think that the kind of, I don't want to say gaminess, but that kind of, you know, lamb quality of lamb went really well with the fruit of this and the spice. Um, I think it was a great pairing. Um, um, and Tinky is sharing, I've seen more Portugal wine tours being offered. We were actually just chatting about that earlier. Um, it is, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've traveled some in the wine business. I've had a lot of friends who have traveled in the wine business and anybody that's ever been to Portugal has always come back and just like, oh my gosh, what a place. Um, so hopefully one day uh, we can all try and make it there. Yeah. Um, it just seems, it seems magical. The pictures, some of the pictures, your research and pictures for this and all just look unbelievable. So when we had our wine class on my, our little staff tasting about Portugal, Harry, we were talking about why are wines of Portugal not as well known as wines of Spain? They've been around as long. And I just was, we were just wondering like why the word hasn't gotten out as much in the community of how wonderful they are and what a value they are because they seem maybe a little undervalued too. You know, I don't know for sure the reason, but I'm wondering, because I know that, um, so where Vina Verde is in that Northwest point of uh, Portugal, just due North of that is the Galicia region of Spain. And that's where Albarinos and things like that come from. Mm -hmm. Albarinos has also been made for, you know, generations, but they just started making their way to the U.S. in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, something like that. And somebody told me at one point that there was not a good infrastructure from like Madrid, which is central northern Spain, to that northwest coast of Spain. So I'm wondering if logistics might have to do something, but they are right on the coast. So you would think that they could be, they would be able to ship out of Lisbon and just come across the Atlantic. But I honestly, I, I don't know why uh, Portuguese wines have not risen. But I think it's, it's like so many regions. Uh, and, you know, I know as a company, we're now representing Balkan wines. Uh, which I'm excited about, Serbia and Croatia and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I think that we Great. are now becoming a more of a world community for wines. We're finding wines from regions that have not been available in the U.S. before. And I think we'll see more and more. But I think in Portugal, um, they are good values, just like I think Spanish wines are too. I think a lot of European wines um, are still pretty good values. Yeah. Uh, I know when I'm dealing with restaurants to do like a wine list, I can last times find really good Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs and Tempranillos and, and uh, Pinot Gris, uh, uh, sorry, Vino Verdes and things like that, or Pinot Grigios um, from Italy and places that are very affordable. And um, I think so many of the wineries in the U.S. are new, and I think a lot of wineries, when they plant grapes to start making wine, you've got like a five-year period of no income while those grapes are growing. So I think a lot of people in the U.S. that start wineries start out with an unbelievable amount of debt. You're starting a business, but you're not really having a return on it for five or six years. I mean, any returns, they're not producing grapes. So how do you do that without, you'd have a deep pocket. So going uh, largely in debt, which is, I think the reason that a lot of American wines tend to have a little bit higher price. You know, these places, and, and, and these are generations old, uh, like at four centuries old, things like that for some of these producers. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to think that most of their debt is paid off. I don't know, but you never know. <laughs> 
Uh, there's a question here from Joanne. In what wine stores or restaurants do you place your Portuguese and Balkan wines? Uh, Balkan wines right now um, for restaurants, um, Restaurant Adara over in Jackson Ward or Carver, maybe that is it, uh, on Lee Street. Uh, I think it is Lee and First. Um, he's been a big supporter so far of my uh, Balkan wines, as the Balkan restaurant has, which is out on Patterson Avenue uh, in the West End. Um, but as for shops, a, lo I mean, a lot of my shops I deal with, which are like the Stella's Groceries and the Jay Emerson's and Elwa Thompson's and place like that, um, they all have the Raza Vino Verde. That's a very well, uh, easy to find bottle. We have that in a lot of places. The Herdad de Gambia, the red, um, not so much. And honestly, it kind of goes back to maybe what you were saying, Liz, about the fact that, you know, Portuguese wines just aren't as known or accepted yet. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of having a really cool red wine from Portugal and showing it to all the, the guests here today is a great way to um, uh, expand palettes of, of wines people might not have had. And there, there are, I mean, you're, uh, the price on this for the, the tasting tonight that we did, Liz, was mm -hmm. this, how much was oh, this? I don't, I don't oh, remember sorry. what I'm I don't remember either, I don't remember either. Um, we, have, we do have a good, I didn't know, I didn't realize until I looked at my wine list, but I do have a fair amount of wines from Portugal. I don't have a very lengthy wine list and I have probably five or six wines from Portugal on it, which I was surprised. So I guess my tastes tend to go in that, in that area too. Well, it, it's a very warm climate. You know, you got the Azores right off the West coast of it, which I've never been to either, but I understand it's pretty much like going to the, the tropics. Mm -hmm. um, you got that, that Southern trade wind. So you have palm trees and a lot more beach type things that you think of as not being off the coast of uh, Portugal or Spain. Yeah, and I was, and you can also get, of course, both of these at Amuse. So that's the other restaurant these are available at. Um, and I think there's still bottles left via VMFA to go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I see where, I see where uh, someone went to Portugal for a port, which, yes, I'm sure. I think that's a, uh, I bet most travel uh, to Portugal has been to visit the uh, Porto region. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a it's not a, a, a large country. Um, again, I haven't been, but I'm sure that you could probably catch trains from up in the port region to Lisbon, the capital, um, pretty quickly and probably pretty reasonably too. You could probably see a lot of a lot of cool regions um, with not a whole lot of travel. Um, there's another uh, suggestion here uh, for a Croatian wine program. Yeah, um, it's it's so interesting. So this Balkan uh, uh, or um, importer that we're dealing with uh, has a lot of Ser Serbian and Macedonia and different things. And for some reason, not much in Croatia. And I have heard about Croatian wines way longer than I have heard about Macedonian wines or uh, um, Serbian wines. Um, but for some reason, this importer does not have much in the Croatian. Mm. So uh, that is actually a question I have out um, asked by some of my customers. Why aren't there more Serbian wines in this portfolio? So hopefully we will, we will find some. But you know, even if not, there are Croatian wines out there. And I think a Croatian or just maybe a Balkan tasting might be kind of fun. if Because yeah. the grapes are very unique. Um, you know, we all know, I think most people that drink wine know probably 20, 25-ish grapes. But there are thousands of grapes. I know my wife is always like, I've heard you talk about wines and bringing wines home for years, but I'm bringing them so many new wines with grapes that she's never heard of that honestly I'm learning about. Um, it's an ever, it's an ever uh, evolving and learning um, mm -hmm. thing with wine. It's agricultural, so it changes every year. And in so many different parts of the world, there's so many different grapes grown that are exciting. So. Yeah. Well, um, art can be the same way. So we're gonna, <laughs> there's always something new to learn. And I've definitely, with the two works uh, chosen for this one, <laughs> have learned some things new uh, to me. Um, so the first work we're gonna look at is this watercolor by Emmerich Essex Vidal. It's called Hack Seja Lisbon. So again, you know, this winery is close to just south of Lisbon, very close. So that made it a natural kind of to talk about. But what's interesting too is much like Edouard Bobat, um, Vidal was very interested in capturing what he saw. Um, now he was traveling for a very different reason. He was in the Navy, uh, the British Navy. So he kind of went again all over um, the place. I mean, he was in, in Portugal, he was in 
um, South America quite often um, in Canada. He, he just, again, traveled all over and everywhere he went, he made these uh, watercolors to document what he saw. Um, and they're almost like a historic record of the places that he went um, and the time period. So a lot of um, historians do reference his work um, to kind of get a flavor for what was happening um, in the world at the time or places at the time. Um, and so, like I said, this one he made in Portugal in 1832. And I had to really think about like, what does Hack Seja mean? <laughs> because I don't speak Portuguese and I'm not a horse person. So um, digging in a little bit, um, a hack um, is kind of two, can refer to two things, kind of the type of horse that's bred um, for pulling carriages, um, kind of like very, um, and, uh, amicable horse who's going to kind of listen to directions and kind of be content pulling um, a carriage here. Um, so that's what's happening here. Seja, I'm not still still kind of working on that one. So if anybody knows, please feel free uh, to pop in the chat. Um, but again, this is a very observational sort of sketch like kind of watercolor here. Um, but again, you know, could be telling a story, you know, like who's in the carriage, we can't see who's in there. Did someone just get out? Are they just kind of poised to pick up somebody? Um, and then the horse is there sort of just waiting, waiting to kind of move to kind of you look at the left, the horse on the left, he's got one of his back legs just kind of kicked up just a little bit. So maybe getting ready to, to pull away um, there. Um, and then this is like, again, sorry for the pixelated image. Um, not much uh, about Emmerich. Um, we only have that one image I showed you, the one watercolor in our collection. Um, and this is taken uh, a little bit before 1861, so much later past the, the work that we showed. And on the right is just another image from when he was in Portugal. Again, a naval officer, so very interested and water um, and, and ships. So, um, but again, the composition of this is really cool. I mean, just so many kind of angles and direction here. So definitely kind of had that uh, documentarian, but also um, artist's eye in terms of composition. And again, always, you know, fun to dig into the history of the artist. In 1832, same year that our work was painted, he was actually in Portugal stationed on uh, a boat working as a translator. And during kind of a skirmish, uh, when he was on on the shore, was shot by a musket in two places, um, just above his hips and almost died. Um, so he was kind of brought back on on the boat and um, survived, obviously, because this image is taken 30 years later, but you kind of have to wonder, I wonder, like, did he paint this before he got shot? When did this happen? So I mean, there's all kinds of like drama around um, this little watercolor of, of a hack, <laughs> uh, a carriage, but again, sort of documenting what was happening in Portugal um, and what could be seen on the streets there um, when he was there in the 1800s, like our friend Edward, you know, who was there maybe a hundred years, a uh, hundred years later. So kind of cool to just think about these two art artists with very different approaches and their interpretation of what was happening in, in Portugal. So this label um, is like Harry mentioned, all of their wine labels feature birds, much to my chagrin, um, just to share, this is like a phobia. So I'm just going out on a limb here for everybody here, just working with my, my phobias. Um, but um, so Harry mentioned again, you know, they're situated really close to an estuary. So, um, that is very important to kind of their brand and how they interact with the land. And so you can actually go on birding tours at the winery and combine that with a wine tasting. So again, if birds are your, and wines are your thing and you're going to Portugal, definitely seek this winery out. So um, this, so every bird that's on their wine bottle um, is inspired by a bird that's native to the estuary there. So this particular selection is based on the black winged um, stilt bird or stilt. Um, and you can see in this kind of mosaic um, uh, image here, almost like a mosaic watercolor. Um, it's got the long pink legs, almost like a stork here. And then um, a very thin, thin black beak. 
and that kind of white and black um, coloring on its body. So I just love that they're again, sort of like, like the Raza, really looking at their surroundings and then interpreting that in a label design. Um, so you can sort of get a feel for what's important to them. And um, again, they're very active and preserving the estuary and promoting the wildlife there. And um, so connecting back to a work of art, again, much like the, the amulet that I shared, this sort of allows us to go kind of cross-cultural. Um, so we're gonna take a look at this uh, scroll painting from our Chinese collection, a mortal crane by a pine branch um, or pine tree. And pines are also around in this estuary. So um, another nice little connection there. This is by a Chinese artist named Li Kuli. Um, who's working in the 20th, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Again, it's, it's not on view right now. It is a work on, work on paper and ink and color on paper. And then there's a hanging scroll. So in Chinese art, there are kind of three types of painting. So a uh, um, hand scroll, which you would kind of unroll bit by bit and, and study and then roll again. Um, a hanging scroll, which would obviously hang <laughs> on the wall. Um, and designed not to be framed and stay there forever. It's something that you would change out depending on the season. So you could roll it up, store it and change it out with something else. Um, and then album leaves. So again, almost like a book that you would turn the pages. Um, so this continues the tradition of hand uh, uh, of scroll. Um, and in this particular instance, this artist is depicting um, a crane like I said, a crane and a pine tree, which has symbolism within it. So um, symbolizing longevity, both of those things. And it kind of comes from um, a, a kind of legend of this stone hut. And there was one pine tree that was um, behind the hut that was like, a, like very old. And the people who were in the hut, this married couple lived like a very long time, like hundreds and hundreds of years old. Um, and so it was attributed to this pine tree. And when they die, legend has it that they turn into a pair of cranes. And so this association with the pine tree and cranes is the symbol of wishing longevity. And so I kind of, again, thinking about what you were saying, Harry, kind of this tradition of winemaking in Portugal goes back generation and generation. So I love this kind of nod to the longevity and perseverance of this wine uh, culture in this area um, and the importance and, and relevance of, of birds. So um, was that is- uh, About her dad, the Gambia, the winery, um, the winery is surrounded by pine and cork trees. And they talk about the big, just the pastoral scene that they have because they have a lot of animals. They're like, so they're a very natural winemaker. It's a very, uh, it's, it's a very uh, bucolic scene, I think uh, that they have there, which is cool. And then there's, there's a lot of chatter, a lot of good advice here about traveling in Portugal, um, about, Please. let's see, uh, to get from Lisbon to Porto, to get on a riverboat for a cruise up the Douro Valley. Uh, most tour groups travel by bus. There's also a high speed train that takes about two and a half hours. So I feel like we could just pull together. I don't know, Liz. I feel like no. pulling together a tour. Let's do it. I feel good. Let's do it. <laughs> I want to go so badly. <laughs> It'll be so fun. Um, and then just just another example of work by the same artist. Um, just some, uh, This is not in our collection, unfortunately. It's a series of flower paintings, but I just love how these are, again, these make me think of spring, this beautiful season that we're in. I love this kind of cherry blossom tree. Um, I want to say it's, or maybe it's a quince blossom to the left. Um, just some more example of his work, again, very much inspired by nature and this kind of like very fluid um, brushstroke that you see here in this crane. So when I think of, about crane, you know, if it's a symbol of longevity, maybe I could like birds. <laughs> maybe it changes my mind a little bit. <laughs> Can I ask a scroll question? Yeah. So you were saying there are three different ways that scrolls are, scrolls exist. Does it have to do with the content of the scroll? So these are all paintings essentially and not so much information. Does that depend on what type of scroll that we're doing? Yeah, I think for the, for the hanging scrolls, it's definitely sort of either, you know, symbolism or, um, um, 
pictorial, you know, decorative, um, if it is a picture. Now there are some scrolls that would have like poetry couplets on that. So it would, would be read. Um, and I think for the hand scrolls, it definitely is going to be documenting or telling a narrative, you know, that you would kind of unroll piece by piece as you're reading again, right to left as opposed to left to right. So you can kind of position kind of the story as you're catching up or kind of want to like view an excerpt. There's a really great in our resource um, website. So vmfa.museum slash learn. Um, we've got a great resource about um, hand scrolls that was tied to our Beyond the Walls exhibit and our teaching gallery. Um, that was around when we were doing um, Terracotta Warriors so or Terracotta Army. Oh, or wait, that's not right. Imperial, the, the Imperial Palace. Um, Forbidden exhibition city. forbidden city sorry yes during forbidden city um and you can actually um manipulate a scroll so oh, that's cool but yeah and then the, and the albums i'm not too sure honestly i want to mm -hmm. i'm not as familiar with those but these two are uh i'd say hanging scrolls and our collection is probably what we have a little bit more of mm -hmm. um and and those i think again became more popular more in that you know in the 18th, 19th, 20th century. But really, I mean, there's some, we do have some hanging scrolls on view, just not this particular one uh, at this time. But you can, again, explore a collection site to see more examples. I do love the bristliness of the pine needles in this work too, kind of behind the crane. And I'm not sure what he's looking at either, kind of he's, Looking up, maybe for his partner. Aww. Because usually they're in pairs. <laughs> uh, let's see. Again, a lot of great tips on traveling in Portugal. You guys are well seasoned. So, and <laughs> Denise is sharing include Portimao, Portimao on your trip. And Joanne shares stay at the government Posadas, amazing hotels and castles that feature local cuisine. Mm. So good to know. Any and, and any like I don't we haven't heard very much from anybody about how they what they think of this red wine. I think I saw one that they really liked it, but if anyone else wants to chime in on what they think, got a few minutes. Yeah, it's got great aromas. I think the weight of it's really good. It's not I'd call it medium weight. It's not heavy, heavy like a cabernet or anything. Um, but I like the kind of brambly. Uh, dark red fruit notes of it. I feel like it's really opened up, even though, like, in the last 10 minutes that I've just had it in this glass. Sure. Gary? Yeah. Liz? yeah. I opened this bottle yesterday and it tastes completely different. It has way more spice and less fruit the second day. Okay. Um, it still lingers a lot. And um, I actually, the tannins maybe have mellowed out even more because it's not a very tannic wine, but it does have a little bit. Um, but I think they've even mellowed out. But it's still yeah. lovely and balanced. I think it's a great balance of fruit and, and, and the tannins. And again, that's very subjective again. But for me, I like the fruit that's in it, but I also like the tannins that's in it. It's not out of sync. No. Uh, yeah, Natalia says it reminds us of a Malbec. I could see that. I can see that too. Yep. It's got a little bit of a gaminess to it. All right. I was going to say, like, I'm like, ugh, I wish I had that lamb. The lamb, actually, yeah. You can, you can have it. Come on in. I know it's actually getting really loud in there. I feel like there's a lot of people having the lamb right now. <laughs> this is, this is at 6.30, right? We could be there in 35 minutes. Or so. There you go. Yeah. Open till 8. I don't know. I heard we're full tonight, though. Oh, yeah, we're pretty full. It sounds full. <laughs> yeah, we are, since the weather is so daunting. I wish we could have the patio open, but... Mm. It just rained a minute ago. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe we'll open it up after a while. Yeah. Um, and Joanne says she loves this wine, but honestly never had a bad one from Portugal. Mm -hmm. Cheers. That's, <laughs> that's an endorsement. <laughs> that is an endorsement for sure. For sure. Sorry, I'm having a, there's a guest outside my little door here. <laughs> it's not a crane. How long? <laughs> I... I don't know how long the lamb will be on the menu. Uh, we've been changing the menu very frequently. Um, 
because we are using all seasonal things and because it being COVID, we're reprinting our menus every day, which gives chef the opportunity to play around and do what he wants. So um, I can't tell you if it'll be on the menu next week at all, but you can definitely call and ask um, around Wednesday when we reopen for dinners. Please is keep it on next Friday. I'll try. I will tell, I'll tell Greg. <laughs> is there a lunch version? Uh, I don't think he's doing a lunch version right now. We did one for brunch for sure. Easter. Um, lamb. But yeah, I, Greg loves making lamb, so I don't think it would be an issue. And Greek style lamb is his bread and butter. So <laughs> I'm sure that we can twist his arm. No, oh, and I will say Kristen's keeping me straight here. Um, the Forbidden City resource that I mentioned actually is having some tech issues. Um, but there's a lot of great, there's a couple of videos of people doing calligraphy, um, which is a nice tie um, to, to the scroll. I, I should say the calligraphy that's on that scroll is the title of the work and the artist. So inscribed kind of running along the crane. That's cool, uh, Birch's comment there about the tile work. I bet it is probably yes. off the charts. Yeah, that's what they, they're very well known for their tile work, aren't yeah. they? I know that, like, uh, on the bottle, the this is actually a mosaic tile they have at the winery, oh, really, um, of the birds. And I'm sure they probably have multiple mosaic tiles. Of yeah, birds, that's something we really need to. Them. I would love to have in the collection is kind of expand those holdings a little bit. I also, I think that would be my dream kitchen too. Yeah. To have all Portuguese <laughs> tile in it. That would be gorgeous. <laughs> Overlooking the estuary, right? Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> That's how I live. <laughs> well, um, so I want to, again, thank Harry and Liz for, for chatting with us. It's always great to spend time with you both. Um, just learning about wine and food pairings um, and sharing the art with each other. So, um, whoops, I was gonna show mm, a little, little tech difficulty there. Um, okay, yep. Um, so we're gonna um, ask a quick question first and then I'm gonna just encourage you to come back and join us on April 23rd for our beer tasting. We'll be chatting with the founder of Wasserham Brewery, which is out of Virginia Beach. Actually, my uh, colleague Courtney Morano will be hosting that one. Um, and then our next wine is Friday, May 9th and TBD. Um, so we'll, we'll see what, uh, what we got cooking up for you. So be on the lookout in your emails or on social for that announcement. And since we have a, a few minutes, I know we had some suggestions on a Croatian tasting, but if you have any other thoughts on what you would like to see, you know, over the next few months, um, please feel free to drop that, drop that in the chat. Um, and if you've missed past Taste of Art, as I mentioned, you can go onto our YouTube channel and see a bunch of wine and beer uh, explorations uh, to dive in a little bit more. Um, again, having a lot of great comments. You're so welcome. Thanking, thanking us. And um, Donna is sharing brought back fond memories of my trip to Portugal and sent several vineyards that I visit, which is which is great. You know, if we can kind of spark a memory or get you excited about, you know, going in this post pandemic world, um, that makes us happy too. So Harry and Liz, do you want to um, add anything else? Uh, I mean, again, thank you all for asking me again. It is such a fun thing. I've done tastings with the museum for a long time now and we've taken some breaks and started to back up and this is just a uh, I love doing this. I love using the comments. Um, I know I think that you still do a, uh, do you do your survey thing afterwards? Yes. So people will, will definitely get a survey. And so that's really helpful for us. It really is. Um, nice. Yeah. It tells you what you liked about it, what we would, what chances for improvement. And again, kind of, we, we love to pull what you'd like to see next. So our plan is to continue these throughout the summer. And then sort of hopefully when we can come back to in-person programming, we will definitely figure out how to keep a uh, form of this going in some way maybe not twice a month but, but we'll get to something <laughs> well thank you again thanks again everyone for tuning in and have a wonderful weekend thank you everyone thank have you. a great weekend bye bye